Well, grace and peace be to each of you of God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the anointed one of God, and let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. It is a day you have made, and we rejoice in it. Lord, we have entered into Pentecost, and we thank you for that. We thank you for this time that we remember that you poured out your Spirit upon those disciples who were as in one accord praying together and waiting for being empowered from on high before they went out and changed the world. We ask you, Heavenly Father, now to bless our time together and bless this word, which is from your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's text, we're going to read all of Acts chapter 2, because it is a wonderful text from uh, God's holy word about the pouring out of his spirit at Pentecost. Now, Pentecost, if you know, God's people had been celebrating and had been observing Pentecost, they call it Shavuot, uh, for about 1,450 years because the instructions given by God to observe the three feasts of the Lord were given at Mount Sinai. And so that was about 1,450 years before this happened. So they had been celebrating Shavuot, Pentecost, for a long time. Now, the way we get, we get the word Pentecost is, one, it's Greek, and the word pente means 50. And what it is, is it's the counting of the omer. Passover, then you have first fruits. You come on on up, come on on up. And you're, you're counting the omer. Now, if you want to know what an omer is, I had to find that out yesterday. Because I thought, I know it is a biblical dry measure. But how much? Is it a cup? Two cups? What is it? Is it a bushel basket? Uh, you know. Turns out it is approximately 9.3 cups. That's quite a bit. So, 9.3 cups of whatever you're measuring equals an omer. But here they're counting the omer and they're counting from 1 up to 50. Counting 1 up to pente. All right? So that's why in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. In other words, when they had finally reached 50, the day of Pentecost had come. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And one sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused. Because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? Others, mocking, said, they are full of new wine. But Peter, 
standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves also know him, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, And having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says of him, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Be saved from this perverse generation. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles' Now all who believed were together and all had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple 
and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. I love this passage. You know, we know that our God is a promise-making God and a promise-keeping God. What's hard for us sometimes to wrap ourselves around is how long it takes sometimes for God to fulfill his promises. Joel said, the Lord speaking through Joel said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and your daughters. For however long that was, you know, from Joel until this day, they've been waiting and waiting and waiting. They had no idea what it would be like when the Spirit would be poured out on all people. Joel had said it, he prophesied it, and Peter said, this is that. But what a difference the Spirit made in these men. I mean, just consider the difference it made in Peter being filled with the Holy Spirit. The difference between him the night of Jesus' arrest, Mr. Scaredy Cat, and now Mr. Bold going to stand up for 3,000 people and give a testimony of what he had seen and what he had heard regarding the Christ. The difference in the world, all it was, was the Spirit. The Spirit of the living God was now dwelling in him. Before Jesus' arrest, Peter said, I'll even die with you. In his flesh, he was like, I'm out of here. Denied him three times. In the power of the Spirit, he stood up before everyone. Because now he was clothed with the power of God. And it's exactly what Jesus said. Stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Clothed with power on on high, they went from being frady cats to being bold as lions. In the power of the Spirit, they no longer cared or were afraid of what might happen to their earthly bodies. I mean, look at it this way. What could anybody do to them? Yes, somebody could come along and kill their bodies, but they could not kill their souls. They could not, nobody except the Lord God himself can send a soul to hell. And so they knew, yes, they may have to endure some momentary pain to die physically, but as Paul said, I'll be with the Lord. So they knew in Christ Jesus Their souls were safe and sound in the palm of God's hands. Their attitude needs to be our attitude today. God has not removed his spirit from the earth. The spirit of the living God dwells within every single believer in Christ Jesus. This same power, the very first time we even hear of the spirit of God, what is he doing? He's hovering. He's brooding over the face of the waters. Just before the words are spoken, let there be light. But this same power that brooded over the face of the waters, this same power that raised Jesus from the dead, this same power now dwells in us, and that power has not diminished over time. It's not like a battery that discharges and has to be recharged, or sometimes just dies, and can't be recharged. No, the spirit of the living God is never going to be diminished. His power is always going to be perfectly, 100% tapped off. Our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So every single one of us has everything we need to be bold, as lions in the face of all kinds of trouble, even death. We really need to get this thought in our heads as we face the mounting trouble in our world. I know, we were all hoping for a return to normal. It's not going to happen. 
it isn't going to happen. I mean, as you know now, cities are burning. What happened to George Floyd should not have happened. Whatever was going through the mind of those cops, I have no idea. But whatever happened should never have happened. I don't know what Mr. Floyd did. All we know is what we know. We've got a lot of video. And the enemy has used that event, that death, to ignite a firestorm throughout our cities. The rioting is not a protest. The rioting, what we're seeing, the burning of the cities and the destruction of property and the hurting of innocent people, that's lawlessness. Which we're told in the scripture is going to happen, that the spirit of lawlessness is just going to keep spreading and spreading and spreading throughout the earth. We are seeing it. This is lawlessness. I don't know if things will get back under control. I don't know if the National Guard or the State Guards and all this, I don't know if they're going to be able to quiet things down. But the return to normal, it isn't going to happen. I wish it would, but it's not going to happen, so I've got to just take my wishes and go, y'all go over there. And I need to draw closer to God. We all need to draw closer to God now. God is the one that we need. The spirit of the living God who dwells in us is the one that we need to rely upon. You see, now is the time that we have got to truly ask God for wisdom and discernment because what did Jesus tell his disciples? In Matthew chapter 24, he said, "Be be, be careful, beware, do not be deceived because we're living in a time where just about everything is deception. So what's true and what's not true? So we need wisdom. We need discernment. Now is the time to ask God to give us boldness to proclaim Jesus Christ, crucified, buried, risen from the dead, ascended to heaven, and soon to return to the earth. We need that boldness to tell it to anybody we have the opportunity to share it with. One of the things that Peter said to his first group there, that crowd, he said, you know, be saved from this wicked and perverse generation. Well, we live in a perverse generation. The message that we have is the exact same one. Repent and turn. Come to God. Get out of this perverse generation. There is only one salvation. There is only one way to be saved, and that is through Jesus Christ. Like Peter, we have the message of hope for every single man, woman, and child on earth. Every single man, woman, and child needs to hear it. And we have the power dwelling in us to declare it. Okay, we can't be like Peter before he received the Holy Spirit and said, I I can't do this. In our own power, no, we can't. In the power of the risen Lord, in his spirit, we do have the power. And we have the authority to go and do it. Now, it might be that we don't know anybody who doesn't know Jesus. Maybe everybody that we know, know, knows Jesus. Okay. Even if that's so, we still have a world full of people we can pray for. 7.7 7.7 plus billion people on planet Earth. Many people, many people do not know Jesus. Now, I may not come in contact with somebody who doesn't know Jesus. You may not come in contact with somebody who doesn't know Jesus. But Jesus knows exactly where every single person is. And he knows how to get them connected with the gospel. And get them connected to the truth. And so we pray for those connections to be made. God knows where to find the lost, and he knows who truly belongs to him. He knows how to reach them, even if we don't. Our prayers are powerful. Our prayers are what is needed. 
So our job, once again, as always, it hasn't changed, is to be about our Heavenly Father's business. Amen.